National Academy of Engineering. Um, so, uh, with that, you know, um, I would like to invite Professor Mitra to the stage and deliver his talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for inviting me for this uh, talk, for the conference. I'm really delighted to be here. And I know after lunch is always a challenge, and uh, I hopefully I will keep everyone entertained. So I start my stopwatch, it's 30 minutes I have. Uh, so the talk is about uh, how we work with interfaces and try to see some application. And I will talk about uh, particularly encapsulations and few other things. And I will end in, in uh, something in 2D materials where uh, some interesting things can happen. Uh, so encapsulation is now used for all pretty much uh, the consumer products that you see, be it shampoo, be it uh, nutraceutical pills like uh, omega-3, fish oil, all of this has a key important thing is that the key ingredient, the core, the API, needs to be protected by the shell layer. So that's how encapsulation happens. And the reason is why we are looking at this is because the current methods which produces these uh, consumer products are typically in the soft gel machines and these are bulky, these are, the process itself is quite complex and so forth. So we wanted to look at a quicker and a much easier way to do encapsulation and uh, coming from interfacial science background, we came up with an idea which is called the liquid-liquid encapsulation. So what we do is we have our API, the code, drop from a nozzle and it is impinged on an interfacial shell layer which is floating on a host bath. So the interfacial shell layer is the layer that forms the shell. So as it, f it drops on the shell, on this interfacial layer, it wraps and then forms stable encapsulation that you see here. This is extremely fast. It's uh, 50 uh, milliseconds per encapsulation. So it's ultra fast encapsulation. It's uh, we can vary the shell anywhere between 500 nanometer to 2 millimeters, so based on thicker shell to a, thinner sh to a thick shell, whatever we want. Is a, and the important is it allows zero microplastics, so this is a big issue, particularly in EU and other regulations happening that you, a lot of these nutraceuticals, uh, there are a lot of microplastics introduced, so we want to create a system uh, which has a different way of looking at encapsulation. So how this happens is, uh, if you see some of the videos, uh, you'll see that uh, at a particular uh, Weber number, so this is related to the impact height, you have the, or the, in this case, a laser oil interacting with the canola oil as interfacial oil layer. It wraps in and forms a, um, a stable encapsulation. If you don't have this interfacial layer, of course, you'll not get an in encapsulated drop. Uh, here also we have dyed the interfacial layer to give you a more better idea that indeed there is an encapsulation taking place. So you'll see that if you dye this with some uh, food dye, for example, and then you form this uh, nice uh, yellow color uh, encapsulated drop, and this remains, the shell layer remains intact for a longer time. It's a stable encapsulation process that we get. And then you can have all these globules which you can extract from the host bath as and when needed. So why this is happening is really dictated by the Gibbs free energy, the thermodynamic process. What we have is uh, three pair of things. It is a layer, the core, which is the L1, the interfacial liquid, which is L2, and the host bath, which is L3. So there is a gamma 1, 2. It is the interfacial energy between the core and the interfacial layer gamma 2, 3 between the shell layer and the hose bath and the core drop itself. It has to form a condition for encapsulation as well as this is the most stable encapsulated from un unwrapped st state is not a favorable state. So there are the criteria and things for example, I showed here the laser oil as a core drop, the water as a hose bath and the shell as a canola oil these conditions is valid and not only these kind of triads are fluid, we tested a bunch of like 15, 20 of various combinations of the core shell and the hose bath, all of this follows these kind of conditions. So it's a very generic. However, 
alone, the Gibbs-free energy criteria is not good enough. As you can imagine, you have a viscous layer of liquid here, and the drop has to penetrate because this will have a viscous dissipation. So the drop has to have a kinetic energy enough to overcome that viscous dissipation. And we know that the kinetic energy scales as half mv square. So it has to mass, so it based on the size of the drop and the velocity. So that's why the impact velocity is important. So here you can see that if it is a sufficient kinetic energy, so it can actually uh, overcome the viscous dissipation. However, on the right hand side, if that's not the case, then it gets trapped into the interfacial layer. However, in next few slides, we will show, I will show you how we have overcome this challenge as well, where we can actually do encapsulation even at the, something which is trapped at the interfacial layer as well. So here it shows the plot of Weber, impact Weber number. So essentially the height of, of which the drop is, uh, is allowed to fall on the interfacial layer. And this is the non-dimensional thickness of the shell layer. So as you can imagine, if your shell layer thickness is little, small, so the viscous dissipation required is less, so you can get a encapsulation from very small drop height, right? And as we increase the shell thickness, you need more in energy of impact height, so you have a larger impact Weber number. So that gives me a regime map for successful encapsulation. Now, we are looking at whether these encapsulated materials that we do, can it uh, withstand harsh environment? For example, we know ethylene glycol is completely miscible in water. If I put a ethylene glycol in water, it's completely miscible. However, if I bring an interfacial floating layer, like the one I've shown here, it then actually allows the core to remain in intact. For example, here you can see that uh, other side is completely miscible, but now with the interfacial layer, ethylene glycol, which is a core, is now flow, is within the water bath and it's completely miscible. So that shows the power of this technology in terms of able to uh, withstand harsh environment. So I was mentioning there are the previous, uh, the first uh, thing that we started with the liquid-liquid encapsulation, there are three major, you know, restriction. One is, of course, kinetic uh, energy dependent. So it has size and height of the, is important. It has a density criteria because the core is the heavier, it has to go in. And also, the cargo extraction is not possible. For example, if I have to cure it, if I cannot, if I drain that liquid water bath, of course, the gives free energy doesn't hold and then it will become unstable. What we did is quite interesting. We said, well, if we, instead of a pure liquid phase, if we make this as a viscoelastic material like PDMS, now we can actually utilize the trapped phase as a stable encapsulation. So this is the trapped phase now within the interfacial layer, which is now a PDMS. And if you look at the spreading parameter, now the spreading parameter will dictate whether this is a stable phase or not. And indeed, now with this uh, various combinations, with the viscoelastic material, this wrapped state become a stable state. So it's quite interesting how this, you can tune the different uh, parameters and then uh, or the vis or the floating layer itself, that would give you uh, um, uh, encapsulated state. So of course, uh, there are, these are videos which shows that how the encapsulation takes place at the interface and then there are a lot of uh, you know, flow physics that I will not go into details of this, but uh, this shows that at the interface, now you have an encapsulated uh, or stable trapped state using a viscoelastic material. So what we did is we actually essentially by flipping from a pure liquid, which is a canola oil to a PDMS, we have expanded the range of the encapsulation. We don't need that high impact and so forth. And also, with this, uh, we can do a lot of different interesting things. You know, coming from Canada, you know, maple syrup is a favorite, so we put maple syrup in it. We can encapsulate maple syrup. We can even in ma encapsulate maple syrup with the ferrofluid. So these are individually wrapped uh, maple syrup ferrofluid, and then they're overall wrapped with that encapsulated uh, PDMS. So these are all different things on the same payload. You can have different cargos or different functionalities built in. 
So the qu question is how rigid this can be? Well, that's an advantage of this technique is because I can actually vary the thickness of my shell material. So if I want to release a payload by, by the chewing of my teeth, so that is a different pressure versus if I want to you, you know, release it by the fingertips, so that's a different pressure. So we did some experiment with load cell and we wanted to see how based on the, what is the force that it can withstand based on the various uh, thickness of the shell. And these are all extremely stable, and I think I have videos uh, here. It will show that uh, uh, they are easy to handle, and uh, they can uh, be, we can move it at our will. So for example, these are extracted and cured capsule. On the other side, you can see that there's load cell. We can put it under pressure. Still, it remain, it withstand, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, encapsulated cargo that we have in the system. So this is extremely uh, stable system. So my student is shaking it and all this, so nothing happens to these uh, cargoes. So uh, as I mentioned, a wide range of applications we can look at. What we call these are experience-driven drink. For example, you can have honey. Honey is typically miscible in water, but you want to have a taste of honey after a drink or something, so we can encapsulate this. So we also extract this by UV curing, individual ones, if you need to be. Or often these kind, this technique of uh, uh, the impact-driven liquid-liquid encapsulation, the first part of the technique, is, is very important for beverages and things like that where you want to have these flavored beverages. So we can use this where it, everything is in the entirely liquid phase. You know, don't need to extract it as well. So next we try to see how we can uh, do different kind of uh, core. For example, uh, this uh, ferrofluids, which are magnetic nanoparticles, so, which are used for a number of applications for uh, cell sorting, for drug delivery, targeted drug delivery. So that's what one was our uh, aim for this work. And then we use the same kind of thing, but now with the PDMS, we are using uh, ferrofluid as a core, and now we use a magnet. So that's an external magnetic field. So what happens here is that still it's an interface, it gets wrapped, but you now need additional magnetic field to pull it across the interface into the host bath and create a stable encapsulation. So there's additional force, uh, apart from the interfacial forces, you need the additional magnetic force to make it work. So here, for example, I'm showing a regime plot of where we have a bond number, which is essentially the strength of the magnetic field and the thickness of the PDMS or the shell layer. So there are some videos which we'll show here so if your magnetic field strength is too high, actually you can get some unstable region because it can, the drop can spread, it can break, and so forth. So there is a fine tune between the thickness of the shell layer and the strength of the magnet. So the magnet is here. So what kind of strength? So you can see these are un, unsuccessful, enca no encapsulation. Some are metastable and these are in, uh, you know, encapsulated regimes. So there is a, some fine balance to this. How interesting thing is, you know, once you have the encapsulated material by magnetic field, you can now move it at your will for targeted drug delivery and so forth. You can move it in various directions. Here is another interesting thing we did is multiple cargoes of same, of same ferrofluid. So as you can imagine, if the drops are of same fluid, ferrofluid, when they come together, there's a drop coalescence happen. So they form a big droplet. However, in this case, it's not happening purely because there's a very thin PDMS or the thin shell layer is always bounding them in a stable way. And then you have the complete cargo there. So this, uh, this technique allows you one load to be ferrofluid, one to be paramagnetic and so forth. So you have a combination of different magnetization of the load itself for various applications. So it's kind of very versatile too. Next, what we did is instead of a uh, core as a ferrofluid, let's look at what happens if I have a shell layer which is a ferrofluid. So we work with a compound droplet uh, where you have a, say laser oil as a as the outer core and inside you have a ethylene glycol. So ethylene glycol in a Y junction, you create a compound drop 
which is essentially this small drop that you see is ethylene glycol within a laser oil. And now you allow it to impinge on a ferrofluid shell layer, so the, everything is wrapped now by ferrofluid. This combination is quite interesting because ferrofluid, as I mentioned, is a magnetic nanoparticle. So because of the buoyancy effect, so this shell layer, the magnetic nanoparticles will try to accumulate on the top of the apex of these drops. So here you can see the ferrofluids are at the apex of the drop when in a typical stable configuration. And here you can see the ethylene glycol, which is inside the laser oil wrapped, but still it is always wrapped, otherwise it, it will, everything will break. So there is always a layer, even though you see con highest concentration here, but there is always the ferrofluid always play, plays all around this drop. But now if I bring a magnetic field here, I can pull this uh, ferrofluid, uh, those nanoparticles in the drop closer to the bottom and that can create some magic, yeah? So this is what it is shown here. So we can vary the distance uh, between the, the, between the uh, wrapped drop and the ferrofluid. So if I in decrease the distance, I increase the magnetic field, and then that's why the magnetic fields, uh, magnetic nanoparticles are more drawn closer to the bottom of the drop. And this has an important ramification. So this is an experiment we did. So what we are doing here is one such compound droplet, and then there is another such compound droplet in a certain distance apart. We bring them. Since they are wrapped in ferrofluid, I can use an external magnetic field, and I can bring them closer together. So now they are brought closer together. See, they are coming together, applying the magnetic field, but they are not merging, because you can see that they are individually separate, as I am increasing further the bond number, so essentially the magnetic field, now they are close and they coalesce and they merge, but still there is a separation and then you can see the two separate individual cargos from two separate drops remain still intact, yeah? And then eventually this thin uh, uh, separation, they, uh, the drainage takes place based on the magnetic field strength and now you can see these two separate ethylene glycol drop from two different cargos. They come in the apex and now they merge to form a single ethylene glycol. By further increasing the magnetic field, I can actually, I can drain that shell layer and I can release the ethylene glycol from the top and you, because it's dyed, so in water you have the complete miscible, so it has the pink color. So this kind of interesting manipulation one can do by using these kind of system. So I can move them around, as I mentioned, I can bring them, coalesce them together, and then I can release at my will as uh, based on different strengths. So this is a various interesting applications one can do. So with this, uh, what we did is we created a startup which is called the uh, SLE Enterprises BV. It's a Dutch startup. It is in Eindhoven, the birthplace of Philips. Uh, so this is a um, uh, machine which is uh, which we MVP we call it. So it's a four nozzle. And these are cuvette. You can see with uh, with these kind of uh, uh, like canola oil in it, and so we can bring this nozzle in, take it off. Of course, there are more finer things to it because there are other nozzles comes in. Because when you are curing the interface, because you have to make aware that if you are curing this, uh, so interfacial layer can also get cured. So we have to have a nozzle that takes, sucks out the interfacial layer. We can use the interfacial layer more as, as and when needed. So it's a very continuous. And with the four nozzles, uh, we can get a uh, throughput of close to 200 and 30,000 encapsulation per hour. So it's a highly scalable system that we are able to create by this process. So the question remains when we are looking at this uh, uh, issue is that, you know, when this kind of compound droplet, there's underlying thin flame and so forth, how we can look at this. So typically these thin flames that are formed, they are in the order of maybe 15, 20 nanometer, maybe 30 nanometer, these are below the diffraction limit of a normal microscopy system. So what we did is in our lab is uh, we developed a system called the dual wavelength 
refraction interference contrast microscopy. It's a very interesting tool we developed. So we have a two laser sources. One is the red and the green. So they move, uh, they are, uh, they, they are passed through an objective and then they move across the interfaces. So it's an interface based technique. So it's essentially, it goes back to Newton's ring, high school physics. So you create interference. The reason we are using two light waves, two uh, laser sources, because with one laser source, you will able to get uh, the interference patterns, but essentially the height of the of those uh, interference, you need to have another laser source. So based on, these are calculations, based on Bragg's law, you can re recalculate it. You can recalculate back the um, height. So here, for example, in a calibration system, we are showing a glass sphere in contact. It's a perfect contact with the glass slide. You can actually come up with the, because the glass sphere shape we already know. So we can back calculate and come up with the, side, the shape itself. So it's a very powerful technique. Uh, it has a pinhole, so it's almost like a um, uh, uh, confocal microscopy. So the pinhole really dictates how lowest or the, how much reduction of the noise that we can have so that we can uh, calcul calculate our film thickness at a most accurate level. So uh, the, uh, some of the interesting work we did is uh, looking at a drop-wise condensation of uh, low surface tension fluids and these are teeny tiny drop. So this is very one small drop. And the advantage of this interferometry technique is that these are 2D images, but it carries the 3D information. So we can actually back calculate and calculate entirely the shape of the drop itself. So we looked at a certain motion of these things. So for example, a very unique unidirectional motion of, uh, oops. I think there's a video. So these are very small drops. Uh, and the other edge that you are seeing inter interferogram is a very large drop. So there's a unidirectional motion, which only happens for this ethanol condensation on high energy surfaces and doesn't happen others. And these are due to thermocapillary movement. And these, these kind of uh, very thin flim precursor mediated movement we can visualize by this uh, very interesting tool that we developed. Uh, we are also interested in contact mechanics and adhesion. For example, we are looking at things like uh, solid in contact with viscoelastic solid, liquid in contact with viscoelastic solid. So if you look at uh, when you have a perfect contact from the contact mechanics, if I have a solid in contact with another solid, you have a contact radius, which is a Hirschian contact. However, when you have this uh, in some, in terms of the gel or soft film, then something like JKR and things like comes into play. We are looking at a particular case where the contact radius is of comparable to that of the coating or the thin film or the gel that we have on a glass slide. So these are interesting phenomena that we are able to look at using this interferometric technique. And we are looking at the long range dynamics. So these are, you know, almost like days. We are looking at how, uh, what is happening at the contact or the adhesion between the solid, in this case, a glass sphere kept in contact on a gel surface. And uh, the interesting is the long range dynamics and this we are able to capture because the liquid phase that are present in the gel because of the contact mechanics, they actually come out of the gel phase and it forms a wetting ridge. And the refractive index of this gel and the liquid phase is different. So there's a contrast of the refractive index. That's where any point I have a contrast, my interferometric technique will work and that will give me the signature or the profile of this kind of wetting ridge. So I can accurately look at what is the liquid phase that comes out of this kind of a long range uh, long time dynamics of the adhesion between a solid in contact with a, a deformable phase. Uh, so in a, when we have this kind of uh, adhesion uh, issues like, you know, which is a very pertinent in the surface science, often we rely on uh, this goniometry kind of a technique where you bring a drop in contact with a solid and it has been shown that uh, any, you know, difficult to demarcate, particularly in a superhydrophobic or phobic surfaces, the contact 
area, contact angle, and 3% uh, error or 2% error can create a, almost 100% error in the adhesion measurement or the walk adhesion because walk adhesion is related to essentially the contact angle hysteresis. So we came up with an idea of looking at this from more fundamental is uh, a direct measurement. So it is a cantilever based technique. It's a kind of high school based system where what we are looking at is uh, we, we want to have a probe drop whose uh, we want to measure the con adhesion of the drop with the substrate. We bring the characterizing substrate closer to the drop, allows it to hold, and then we retract. So then there is a snap off of the cantilever because uh, as we know, if we know the co spring constant of the cantilever, force is K times X, the spring content constant times the displacement, we can actually by image processing, measure the displacement, and then uh, can calculate the adhesion force. So this is uh, an interesting work. Uh, we were looking at, for example, bacterial adhesion. Uh, so uh, often uh, we uh, people look at uh, microparticles, for example, to as a surrogate for bacteria. So microparticles, if we uh, if I increase the concentration, the Contact angle hysteresis looks like this, so the walk irradiation will follow a similar manner. However, if I look at the technique that we developed, it has a similar kind of train as that of the contact angle hysteresis with the increase of concentration for inert particle. But if for active matter, like biological matter, like bacteria, like E. coli, what we see is that as we, uh, as we increase the concentration, our technique shows that actually in reality, your adhesion uh, forces, uh, or adha walk adhesion decreases and so forth. So this is quite counterintuitive, but your inert particle, if I make the bacteria die, they follow the same as that of the microparticle. So in a sense, it uh, gives us a way, a window opportunity to look at active matter inter interaction and adhesions in, uh, in, uh, with the solid surfaces. We also look at uh, the wetting of this uh, via, uh, in, in terms of face masks. And also, this is uh, quite interesting. We were looking at uh, during the COVID time of a human coronavirus 229E, which is a surrogate uh, for COVID, uh, where we created a, a cell line, uh, human, because in the virus, uh, you have to create a human cell lung epithelial line and then. Uh, we had the cytopathy of the cell and then uh, infected that with the virus and then we looked at how the virus interact with this kind of repellent surfaces and so forth. And further we expanded, uh, the, expanded this technique. So these pictures, as you can see, these are relatively phobic surfaces, but we expanded this technique even for moderately phyllic surfaces. And I will not go into details because of uh, the time constraint that I have. So the next, uh, few slides I will talk about some wetting of the 2D materials. Of course, there are a bunch of controversy between whether a drop sees a substrate like a graphene or to the, uh, or to the glass uh, on which the graphene, uh, the, you know, graphene is typically supported on that matrix. So there is a lot of controversy to this. So we are looking at HBN, which is um, hexagonal boron nitride. So it's a sp2 hybridized state, but uh, there's a subtle difference because these have a uh, uh, boron, uh, which is uh, uh, something which we have an uh, ionic bond here. And uh, then we were looking at a uh, planar HBN, and uh, we found that it has a wetting translucency similar to what has been reported by graphene. But the question is, what happens when you have this as a structured surfaces? In other words, when you have this kind of a ribbon things, right? So. In these kind of 2D materials, the interesting part is you can have armchair and zigzag configuration. So the end groups are different. So based on the end group, I can have uh, you know, um, uh, various uh, uh, state of wetting, be it a Cassie Baxter or Wenzel, or can have a transition of this. So for example, in this case, uh, I'm rushing a bit uh, because I'm running out of time. Uh, in this case, for example, if I make this, uh, 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 this is armchair edges. So if I make the armchair and the top as a, f uh, as a uh, zigzag, so I can make it this as a uh, phobic part, and then it will have a different you know, outcome because the forces of interactions are, in are different. And then I can have also, I can switch that if I make this, the edges as a zigzag configuration, so I can have a, 
uh, Wenzel transition. So this kind of tunable transition is not feasible in a normal bulk material unless you do chemical uh, modifications and so forth. So these are very interesting things. Uh, we look at the energy landscape. I think in uh, some of the previous talk in the morning was also talking about energy landscape. It's very critical, particularly when we are looking at some of the transport phenomena in extreme confinement. So these are angstrom confinement. And uh, these are showing that here you can have, uh, that's also again possible for 2D materials, that uh, you have a misalignment either in a translationally, you can move the two layers uh, in a one given direction or you can rotate them. So if I have a rotational um, uh, asymmetry, the, uh, the, the, the uh, energy landscapes are pretty regular. So that means there is no change in the friction of the water. But if I have a translation, then it changes the friction. So you can change the water friction in these kind of confinement by using this uh, kind of technique of uh, understanding extreme confinement. So that uh, inspired us to do this work further on this, uh, which uh, we call a trap iron system. So this is actually a nature inspired des design. In everyone's body, we have this aquaporins. So aquaporins are uh, natural membrane proteins that allows water to move through, but rejects the salt. That's why we are able to survive. However, the, when you look at the bulk water, is a tetrahedral motive. It's connected with hydrogen bond. But when we are in this extreme confinement like these ones, which are extreme confinement, you know, 8, 10 angstrom confinement, these are no longer hydrogen uh, tetrahedral motive because hydrogen bond relaxes and then they become a linear chain. So this is the technique we have used. And we are trapping iron like cesium, sodium, and applying electrical field. And we, it can be a deterministic process. So we created this startup, a Canadian startup called Aquabix. So it's essentially trying to look at the liquid phase, uh, some uh, uh, kind of uh, interesting uh, trap iron configurations. So uh, of course, uh, the entire work that I presented is, and I've showed a number of pictures of uh, along as I moved along, all the people, uh, the, my graduate student, postdocs, uh, uh, PhD students who really create the magic in the lab and they are just extremely bright people. I'm ha lucky to have them in my lab and I learn from them a lot. And this is what I think is the best part of my job is I get to learn from these young minds. And of course, uh, uh, my uh, funders and uh, industry partners that help through the process. And thank you for your kind attention. Love to take any questions. Thank you, Professor Sushanta, for a very interesting talk, uh, talking about a few topics of uh, interest and in what you're working on. Now we have time for maybe two to three questions because we have to move to the next talk. So we have a question from Professor Tropia. Okay, so uh, I would like to ask a question about your normogram, so the regime map. Your regime map, the normogram. Regime map. Yeah, yeah. Have you, could you put it up? Uh, which, it was which Weber one, number. Uh, the first one? Or? Yeah, it was Weber number against uh, thickness of your layer, I think. Ah, okay. And I, so first of all, there's something that I find non-intuitive about that nomogram. So uh, if I understand it, the upper left is encapsulation. And yeah, if you, everything if we change, here is encapsulation, yeah. yes. And yeah. so Weber number, you know, our rho d u squared divided by... Impact. So if we go ballistically, I mean, if it was possible, hypothetically, really, really fast velocities, and you say at really fast velocities, you still get encapsulation. Uh, no, it's because not that would be very, very high Weber numbers. Very, very high. That uh, is not feasible. So you have to really then look at a huge tower kind of a, you know, yeah. impact. Well, but uh, that, will, that will not create a stable impact. Okay, so there is a break. limit there that there we don't see. There is, of course, see. a limit, yes. And, yes. and the other question is, um, that's interesting, but even more interesting would be to know the thickness of the encapsulation layer. Yeah, so we have, we actually, I didn't present here, so we have actually calculated the thickness of the encapsulated layer. So by But that would be Weber number dependent, huh? Yes, exactly, yeah. And uh, we have a way to calculate because of this interferometric sure, process, sure. so we yeah. can calculate for each of these cases. We have a graph, it's actually in the paper, what is the actual thickness of this encapsulator? Yeah, that's my last suggestion. Yeah. Why don't you use three wavelengths and yeah, the RGB, exactly. and then that's you have a longer doing, yeah. two pi ambiguity uh, yeah. problem. You don't, you circumvent the two pi ambiguity problem. Yeah. And in RGB you have anyway. Yes, so. exactly, yeah, thanks. So how did you make that small, uh, 
uh, thickness conduit in Angstroms. You told it's ah, Angstrom. How we do? Uh -huh. So this is the uh, This is a very good question. I didn't go. I didn't because of the time. I didn't go. So you know, in normal when you do micro nanofabrication is a lithography process. So it's a different kind of a process. But this thing that we do is called Van der Waal assembly. So these are very different kind of a fabrication technique that you use for 2D materials. Is you lift off and then you put it and then you have an E-beam lithography to create the particular channel. So it's a very different kind of a fabrication process than the traditional micro nano fabrication that you used to. So these are referred to as Van der Waals assembly. Yeah, that's right. So the, if the Van der Waals force between the two interfaces were Yes, exactly. Then and then we put stable, some no? uh, spacers into it. Okay. H. Typically, you can have this on a graphene, and you can put some HBN as a spa spacer to it. Okay. And one, one more question. So, when you were rotating the one of the uh, surface, you told that the viscosity was not varying, right? Whereas when you had a linear motion, it was actually the, something like that. You put. So can you repeat uh, which so, part of the uh, talk is this question? Uh, in the same same thing. Yeah. Uh, you told that the visco when you were rotating one of the plate, when you were uh, rotational, yes, rotational, uh, yes. The viscosity was not. Uh, uh, so there is a not a no change in the energy landscape. Up to sixty degrees, uh, we didn't find any change. So that means the friction is not changing. However, yeah, right. when we are translating it, the friction changes. So what 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 is the reason for that? Well, that's a difficult uh, thing to. Because it's coming purely from the energy landscape, so it's essentially dictated by the Van der Waals, right? Interaction. So that's where the energy potentials are coming in. But pinpointing the Y part, it's uh, not that easy, I would say. Yeah. And also, it depends. If, for example, this was with the graphene, if this was with HBN, and I have a armchair versus zigzag, then itself other more complex things will arrive. Question from Professor Paul. Yeah. Yeah, somebody else, someone else is asking, or can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure. <clears throat> Pertaining to this sort of results that you showed on graphene and some uh, droplets there, uh, are those molecular dynamic simulations? These are MD simulations, yes. So, so those are now very small droplets, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, they are, say, less than a nanometer, or yeah. less. Yeah, yeah. And of under course. that, you have a roughness, which roughness would be much smaller than that. Yes. One or two layers, so these are a stacking of the layers. <clears throat> and the question is, you know, wetting phenomena are very tough to, uh, I mean, they do depend on, on the interaction potentials between your liquid, in this particular uh, uh, case, is water or what? Water, this is water, yeah. Which is rather complex. L LJ potentials. Really. Very complex yes. molecules, and those of the substrate, and those don't exist. <clears throat> because, you know, you could do, uh, people have done those molecules for, for one substance, all right? But once you go to an interface and you're doing magic at the interface, <laughs> right? <clears throat> those don't exist. So therefore, I mean, uh, most people do, and I assume you did the same, uh, some kind of Leonard Jones potential. LJ, right? LJ, yes, yeah. But then, you know, what you get depends on what you do, right? What you assume, so why, of course, I, uh, why should I believe anything you said? <clears throat> yeah, so that's why we are now doing experiments. So that's why we realize. Well, you can do experiments with these sizes. No, not with water. this size, of course <laughs> not this size, but for the trapped <laughs> iron, which in the angstrom confinement, now we can do experiments in the angstrom confinement to look at this water transport and so forth. So that is feasible. What angstrom confinement is this? Huh? What, what angstrom confinement? So these are in the two... Oh, uh, between two graphics. There are people that have looked yeah, at this. So that's Actually, possible. Actually, Alex also yeah. at UIC, I think there yes. is a group there that is looking so at that. So these are possible, but not uh, getting experiment on this is not possible, of course. Yeah. But even there, you know, what they see is, is very... Anyways, thank you. Yeah. yeah. That is a good question, valid question. Yeah.